Joining us now, former Atlanta Fed President Dennis Lockhart, City Chief U.S. Economist Andrew Hollenhorst, and Bleakley Financial Group's Peter Bookfar. He's here on set with me. Welcome to all of you. Dennis, I'll start with you, if I may. You want to go there? Was, was inflation transitory after all? Yeah, it's, it's maybe it's time to rehabilitate the word uh, transitory <laughs> after a couple of years. Uh, it, it could very well be that what, what we're seeing uh, is simply a, a lot of things getting into balance through what I would call natural disinflation. And uh, I wouldn't completely rule that out. Uh, the Fed policies probably help that, but there could also be a process at work that simply means the supply chains are settling down and uh, supply and demand is getting into better balance. Peter, I feel like I need to bring you in here. I'm, I'm not sure. What would you say about that? Well, there's never anything transitory about services inflation. It's always persistently higher, about 3% a year. It's goods prices that have averaged about zero, core goods prices, in the 20 years leading into COVID. That's where we saw that cyclical spike. Now, with services inflation, is it transitory? Well, home prices are up 40% in a couple of years, and they're not falling. They're still rising, albeit modestly. So I think the key for inflation in the next couple of years is so do goods prices settle back to that zero sort of trend, or are we in something that's new, more structural, or maybe one, two, three percent type goods inflation, when combined with persistent services inflation, can lead to maybe three to four percent type trend line inflation sustainably rather than one to two pre-COVID. It's a great point, Andrew. It's why people are debating everything from, you know, what China is going to be doing and, how, and what the impact they'll be having to maybe we get more tariffs, maybe we don't, maybe it doesn't have an impact. Maybe it's, do you want to comment on where you think core goods and, and inflation is headed and what that means for rates overall? Yeah, I think the idea of transitory is probably most clearly a goods sector issue where we have things like used car prices that came up a lot, they've come back down again. I think what the Fed needs to be careful about here is taking too much credit for the slowing that we've seen in goods inflation. That, that really was this kind of special pandemic supply chain affected period. And, and that has proved to be, in a way, in much longer terms than anyone expected transitory. But where you're not getting transitory inflation is in services, I would agree with Peter, um, not only in shelter prices, where we have, you know, if you look at the last three existing home sales numbers, uh, prices moving up at double-digit annualized month-on-month -month rates. That's not going to be consistent with 2% inflation. And then, right, on core goods inflation, um, that's where we do have some structural changes in the economy, which means that we're not going to have the kind of downward pressure that we used to. So structurally, you could have stronger goods prices. Cyclically, you have stronger shelter prices. And then you have wage growth. Wage growth is still running too fast to be consistent with 2% inflation. That's going to push through in terms of non-shelter service prices. So, Dennis, how, from a kind of a policy point of view, we, we did see something very impactful from Powell a year ago. I, if I recall, it was a pretty short speech, and, and people have joked it's the one where he basically just said, you know, hell is coming, for lack of a better term, but that it didn't come. Um, so, so what do you expect from him now? Um, I, ex I expect that he will probably emphasize that the risks are, uh, are two-sided now, uh, that it's not going to be quite as strident a speech as he gave a year ago. Yeah, I don't expect him to introduce anything particularly novel in this speech. I think he'll reinforce messages that we've all heard before in the press conferences, particularly. Um, and uh, you know, I, I would I would expect that he might he might put the current moment in context in order to kind of explain the positioning of the Fed at the moment. But I don't expect a lot of really uh, news coming out of this speech. All right, Peter, we're going to talk more about this in a moment. But what are you thinking investment-wise uh, is at stake here based on the comments we'll, we'll hear in the morning? Well, investment-wise, the most interesting thing over the past couple of weeks has been the rise in longer-term interest rates. You know, we're all so focused on what the Fed's going to do with the Fed funds rate. I think people got complacent that we had this downward trajectory in inflation and everyone thinking that it's all clear on the rate side. And then all of a sudden, the 10-year yield goes up 50 basis points in a month. That is not in control of what the Fed is doing. It's happening for potentially other reasons, like ECB QT, BOJ moving the widening yield curve control. And I think that sort of complicates things here, because uh, it, it, the Powell's next thing, and tying it into investments, is do they keep rates high for a while? Mm -hmm. That's sort of the next battle that Powell has to deal with. And I think that reality is now sinking into asset markets. 
20 times earnings? Well, if the Fed funds rate's going to stay high for a while, do I really want to pay that? Right. And now we're seeing all the retail earnings that are pointing to a softening consumer and what that means. So I, I think this rally in the markets deservingly is getting tested right now. At the same time, bonds are selling off. So you're sort of in that 2022 situation where maybe we're on the cusp of an equity sell-off. At the same time, bonds are selling off. Therefore, there's nowhere to hide other than short-term treasuries.